Amen, amen. Give him praise in the house. Glory, glory, glory. We are glad you are here today. Amen. They're going to be adjusting me there. For those online, we are excited. Uh, we think we got my mic solved. Hopefully anyway, right? Miss Kathy, if you look at your song list, I'm not sure that God has ever nailed it any closer than he did today. Uh, you won't love me afterwards, but that's okay. Um, you know, I get nervous when I stand up to preach. I, I really get nervous every week. But there are times when God begins to give me the same thing over and over and over. And, and I start getting real nervous. Because then I'm wondering if it's me or if, if he's getting ready to do something crazy. And so, with that said... Um, he usually is doing something crazy, and sometimes it's more in me than anywhere else. Uh, but that's a good thing, I guess. Uh, I guess. I believe there's a revival getting ready to break out in the land. And one of the things that's been stated lately, and, and we don't like to hear this, but one of the things that's been stated lately is the reason there hasn't been a major revival in America as of late is the churches aren't quite ready for a major revival. And we don't really want to hear that, but yesterday on the Excellent Ministers page, the page of the Church of God Ministers, uh, there was a pastor in Kentucky that came out and he said, we've been running about 120 since COVID, about 75, and I won't give you a name, but he said, I'm just going to be open and I'm afraid to because I may get crucified. He said, but here's the truth. He said, we get to a point and we stop. And he said, and I'm not sure we know how to go beyond that. I'm not sure how we know how to go beyond that. The Spirit of God moves, the gifts move, but I'm not sure we know how to go beyond that. And I think about things like that a lot, and I'm wondering if honestly sometimes the church doesn't know, all of us just do not know how to go beyond where we're at. And with that said, I believe that's one of the reasons God has called us to imagine greater, but not just imagine greater, but to go beyond where we're at. It's not that where we're at's a bad place. It's not that we're that we've not achieved and that we've not come a million miles because we have each and every one of us. If we died today, we could make it to heaven with with kudos and crowns. But how much more could we do for God if we could not limit ourselves? This morning I want to talk about. Uh, stretching ourselves, and I hope this is the last week we talk about it, but I want to talk about it one more time. Isaiah chapter 54, Isaiah chapter 54, beginning with verse 1. When you have it, we'll stand for the reading of God's Word. Isaiah chapter 54, we're going to read three verses of Scripture. Isaiah 54, beginning with verse 1. Sing, O barren, thou that didst not bear... Break forth into singing and cry aloud, thou that didst not travail with child. For more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married wife, saith the Lord. Enlarge the place of thy tent, and let them stretch forth the curtains of thine habitation. Spare not, lengthen thy cords, and strengthen thy stakes. For thou shalt break forth on the right hand and on the left. And thy seed shall inherit the Gentiles and make the desolate cities to be inhabited. Paul quotes this in chapter 4 of Galatians. He ch quotes chapter 1 of this again. And he's saying to the church that God wants us to stretch forth and be greater than we've ever been before. Before we pay, I want to ask you to do something with me. So uh, we're going to, you don't have to, obviously, it's a volunteer organization. But I'm going to ask you to stretch your hands forward. Stretch your hands forward. Now, twist to the left, or your left. Uh, stretch as far as you can. Oh, yeah, left. I know, we don't know left from right. Now, stretch to the right. Oh, come on. <laughs> Feel those obliques. Oh, it hurts. Now, back forward. Now, stretch up. Now, lean to the right. The hurt, yeah, all right. The stage right now, now left, oh. all right. Now give God a clap of praise, all right. 
Father, bless the remainder of our time together. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. You can be seated. We, str we stretch the body. Uh, we talked about this Wednesday night with the men. We stretch the body to protect ourselves from being damaged. If God wants to stretch us, he's going to stretch us one way or the other, right? Truth is truth. God's going to stretch us one way or the other. It's much better if we stretch ourselves. He was saying to Israel in Isaiah chapter 54, stretch, enlarge, grow yourself. And he does that so that the Holy Spirit can do the work in us. And the Holy Spirit wants to do the work in us. Paul writes it to the Galatians, and he says, don't fall back into the, the things of old. Don't fall back under the law and those type things. Stretch yourself so that you won't fall back or you won't become complacent. And today I want to look at about three areas of our lives that we, if we're not careful, that we can fall back or become complacent. And I want to talk about stretching ourselves in three areas of our life. And she's actually mentioned them, believe it or not, most of them in singing today. He speaks to the prophet Israel, to Isaiah, uh, speaks to them, to Israel through the prophet Isaiah. And he says, I want the, the nation to become, to take the, the desolate places and let them become inhabited. It's a promise from God that this will take place. Paul writes about it in Galatians, as you say, as I said. But now let's look first at our faith. And I want you to see something about faith. Genesis 15, verses 4 and 5, Abraham and God, or Abram and God are having a discussion. And God is talking to Abram, and Abram says that I don't have a descendant. Eleazar is my servant, and he's the only descendant that I have. And God says something crazy to Abram. He says, come outside with me. Now, if you're in the King James Bible, it says, let's go abroad. But the word actually means, let's go outside. And I didn't quite understand that, and I began to look. But do you know what God was actually saying? You're sitting in a tent, Abram. You're in a tent. And the tent is man-made with a ceiling. I want you to step outside what man can do and see what I can do. And he tells Abram, he says, I want you to go outside, and I want you to look at the stars. Now I want you to count the stars. I want you to go beyond the limits. I want you to stretch your imagination beyond the limits. Now, your, in, your offspring will be from your loins, not Eleazar, but from your loins. Your offspring will be as the stars. See, the limit is what I can see in my household. The limit is, is what I can see physically in my mindset. The limit is, is what God has literally, or I've created in me, is my limits. And if I never get my faith to go beyond my limits, how will I ever see what God has fully for me? And I believe this, this is Mark's opinion. I believe when we get to heaven, we're going to get to heaven. We're going to get there because we're saved by the grace of God, by the blood of Jesus. We're going to make it to heaven. Everybody's saved, right? If you're not, then we need to solve that today. But if you're saved, you're going to make it to heaven. You're going to get in and you're going to sit there for that, for that seven-year period while the tribulation's going on on earth. And we're going to see our lives. And we're going to see what we could have been and what we were. And that's when our works are going to be tried by fire, and we're going to see our works. And that's when the Bible says that God's going to wipe away our tears. Because it's going to break our heart where we could have went instead of where we did go. And then, of course, that'll all be over and there won't be any more tears after that. But he said to Abram, he said, come outside and count the stars. That's beyond your limits. This is coming from your bow or from your loins which at your age, that's beyond your limits. Your reproductive possibilities are limited at your age. I want you to stretch your faith, Abram, and believe beyond what you see or the ceiling that you've put on it. Jump to the New Testament. Mark chapter 11, verse 23. Jesus says to them, I tell you the truth. Whosoever shall say unto this mountain... Miss Kathy preached about this, sung about this mountain today, and I didn't know she was doing that. But he says, Whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Thou be removed and thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that these things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he asks. 
Now, we understand that that's beyond our limit. We understand that the Holy Spirit has to do that work. But can I say this to you? I believe today that most Christians, probably 99% of all Christians today, have given up on asking God to move mountains. Why? Because the only time we ask God to move a mountain is when we're placed in a situation where we have to have the mountain moved. Where it is urgent, there is no other possibility. We wait till the death sentence has been called on. We wait till the trouble is there. But that was not what he says. He said that we are to speak to this mountain and tell this mountain to move into the sea. What he said to his disciples was this. He said, I want you to stretch your faith. I want you to begin to stretch your faith. I want to give you the Holy Spirit. I want to give you the ability and the authority to take your faith beyond limits. And to say to your mountain, be moved. And if you speak it, and I know it has to be in accordance to God's will. But if you speak to the mountain and you begin to proclaim to the mountain to move. And you do not waver or doubt in your heart. The mountain will move into the sea. Now, whether he does that with a physical mountain and it gets up and moves, whether he makes a radio wave get to the other side of a mountain where someone can hear, whether he does whatever he does, uses a doctor to heal, it makes no difference to me. But the truth is, it, the limit that we place on it is, is that we see the mountain so many times... And if you want to know the truth, there's an old song that the enemy has had, I believe the enemy's had in my heart all week long is, Lord, don't move that mountain. Give me strength to climb. For if you should move each mountain, I might grow weaker every time. It's an old hymnal that's, that was from, from my childhood. And all week long I've been singing it. And the last couple of days I've got up and sung a different song because that keeps telling me that not to have faith for the mountain to move. And the truth is this, how many of us actually pray for the mountain to move? I know that we do, but, but when do we stretch our faith? Because if we wait until we need to use the muscle, then we damage the muscle. But if we stretch the muscle and tear the muscle a little bit, it hurts a little, but the muscle gets stronger. And then we tear it a little more and it gets stronger and it gets stronger and it gets stronger. It's no different with our faith. And we begin to stretch our faith. I'm not asking you to go out and say, God, I want you to make my car brand new. But if Jesus died for our healing, if Jesus died for our, or if he took stripes for our healing, died for our salvation, if part of the atonement is not just salvation, if his death covered salvation and atonement and stripes on his back is for our healing, then why should we not be praying for our ingrown toenail? Why should we not be praying for God to heal the mountains in our life? Why should we not be speaking unto? Speaking literally means to represent speaking out. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The word of God says to speak to your mountain. I believe that some of us, I'll get there in a few minutes. Let me go on. Jesus said to them, speak to your mountain. Speak to your mountain. Number one, we need to grow our faith. We need to stretch our faith. And I want to challenge you on this today. Number two, you may not like this one, some of you, Miss Kathy. And you really probably will, because I've seen some of the things you're doing now. Psalms 33.3 says, sing a new song. Play skillfully with a shout of joy. Psalms 43 says, he put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and will trust in the Lord. Psalms 96, 1, sing a new song unto the Lord, a new song sing to the Lord all the earth. Psalms 98, 1, a psalm, O sing to the Lord, a new song. He has done wonderful things. His right hand and his holy arm have gained the victory for him. Psalms 149, 1, praise the Lord, sing to the Lord a new song. And his praise in the congregation of the godly ones. Isaiah 42.10, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing his praise from the end of the earth. You who go down to the sea and all that is in it. Your islands and those who dwell on them. 
Psalms 144.9, I will sing a new song to you, O God. Revelation 5.9, and they sang a new song. Revelation 14.3, and they sang a new song before the throne. No less than six times the scripture says sing a new song. Now, that sounds pretty simple, right? But let me say this to you, and maybe you knew this, and maybe you didn't. But did you know this? If you didn't know this, did you know this? That when you sing a new song, a new song speaks to your heart. Music stirs the soul, amen? Music stirs the soul. But did you know that after you have sung a song 40 times, according to every report out there, that the song, you no longer hear the lyrics anymore? You sing it, you know it, but it no longer speaks to you anymore. Now, that's consistently on average. I know occasionally we sing Amazing Grace when we're going through something because we haven't stretched in a while, right? And then we sing it and it stirs us once again. But the truth is, overall, on average, once you've heard that song 40 times, it's no longer new anymore, and it becomes more of a repetition than to stir your spirit to move towards God. Why did God understand that? Why did he write, sing a new song? Why did he write, oh, sing a new song? Sing a new song. Why did he write different ways to worship God? Because he understood that our worship would become mundane. He understood that we would get into a ritual. That our dance would become the same every time and it would no longer be a dance unto the Lord, but that it would become a ritual. Our shout would be the same all the time. Our song would be exactly the same. And while everyone would go, whoo, watch them worship, inside of us, it wouldn't mean anything. It would become routine, if you will. Why would God write, stretch your worship, stretch your worship, stretch your worship, stretch your worship, stretch your worship? Why would he write over and over and over, stretch your worship? Miss Kathy said the other day on Wednesday nights, we come in and we do 30 minutes of worship at 6.30. And, and some ask us to put the words on the screen. And she called and asked that we not. I'm telling on her a little bit. But, and, and I thought, well, some of, many have asked that we do so they'll be able to pick up the song. And she says, well, it stretches me if we don't. And while I was working on this, the Lord said, don't you dare put them up there. Stretch them. Make them work for it. Because they need to stretch. And what I want to say is, actually, it's not them I'm worried about. It's me. To be honest, it's me, Lord. It's me that, that needs the words up there because I don't, I need the words on the screen when I'm watching TV now. Becca says, did you see that? No, I was reading the words on the screen because if I'm going to get it, I need to read it, right? The truth is, sometimes my dance is just a routine. And I hate to admit that to you, and I probably won't admit it to the next service. But sometimes my dance is just a routine. While I believe there's something special about it, it just becomes routine. I can lift my hands, and I think, man, I'm in the spirit now. But the truth is, this is the way I've always done it, right? Or the way I've done it for the last two years or whatever. And I'm thinking, God... If I don't ever stretch me, if I don't ever stretch me in my worship, if you worship like this, and this is the way you always worship, that's beautiful. That is beautiful. And you're blessing those around you, but is it really stretching you? Is it really ministering to God? Maybe it is, and maybe that's that for you, but... But maybe it's time you do this. Or maybe it's time you kneel down. Maybe it's time we stretch our worship just a little. Sing a new song. Number three. Number, number one is our, um, 
Number one is our faith. Number two is our worship. Number three is prayer. Romans 8, verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray, for we ought, for as we ought, but the Spirit maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the heart knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to his purpose, or who are called according to his purpose. I bet you if I ask you and you honestly answered, if you honestly answered, I bet you almost everyone in this room could say that prayer can become routine if we're not careful. I mean, prayer can become routine. How do I pray? I pray every morning in the shower. With the same soap under the same armpit, I'm saying the same words, right? Ha! La, 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 la. Washing my hair with that same soap because I don't need shampoo. I don't have enough to shampoo, right? I actually do use shampoo, believe it or not. I'm praying for the mountain to grow back. <laughs> I don't want that either. I'd rather not have it. As long as this stays, I'm okay. I pray on my way to work. I pray here. That's great because we're to pray without ceasing. Do you know that scripture says that he has the prayer, the Holy Ghost pray through us because he prays the perfect will of God for us? And do you know if we're not careful, our prayers become so routine and so ingenuine, if that's a word, they become so, I'm trembling, they become so ingenuine. And it's not that it breaks the Father's heart because he loves to talk to us. It's that it becomes complacent on our parts. And I believe one of the reasons that he said, stretch yourself, stretch yourself, stretch yourself. And he said it in the Old Testament, he says it in the New. And over and over and over, why did Christ send the disciples out in the boat know the storm was coming? It wasn't so he could scare them. It was so that he could grow them. It was so that he, the first thing he says is, ye have little faith. Why? Because he wanted to grow them. He wanted to grow them. He wanted to expand them. He wanted to stretch them. And it's not so that we can be superheroes. It's so that we can receive what the Holy Spirit has for us. It can receive the revival that's coming so that we can receive the outpouring that God has for us. It is literally so that we can be the vessels that we're called to be. And if you can see this, it literally is to be all that we are called to be and to receive all that he has for us. You can never give someone $50 if they can't handle 10 right? Ralph Carroll gone on to be with the Lord. His wife said one time of him, she said, I said, why do you give him money every day for lunch? She said, because if I give him a bunch of money at the beginning of the week for lunch all week, he spends it. I said, he owns a company. He knows how to handle money. She said, no, he doesn't. She said, Watch. She gave him $100. She said, now, Ralph, everybody go to lunch. Ralph looks at the 100 bucks. He says, come on, everybody, we're going to lunch. He takes the whole print shop to lunch. Spends every dime he has. The lunch is like 80 bucks. He gives the waitress the rest. Tomorrow he needs $10 for lunch again. It matters not. What he has in his pocket is what he will spend. Therefore, he gets only an allotted amount. God will give us what we can handle. And if I never stretch myself, he can never give me more of the blessing either. He can never give me more of the healing virtue to pass out to others. He can never give me more of the miracle signs and wonders if I can't handle it. You say, what do you mean you can't handle it? Well, if I start proclaiming that I did it, right? Matthew 18.3 says, except we be like a child. If you told a kid to move a mountain, he'd just go move it, wouldn't he? He'd just accept it. It's got to be. Let's do it. Where's my shovel? Let's go. If I told a child today, 
that there was angels in this room, here's what would happen. But if I told you that there's angels in this room, yeah, I know. But the truth is, there's angels all about us. There's a mighty army. Second Kings tells us that Elisha said, open his eyes. Lord, open his eyes that he might see that those that are with us are greater than the army that is against us. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young servant. And it says that he saw on the mountaintops chariots of angels with flames and fire. And he saw that the army that had come against them was surrounded by the army of God. And if I can just stretch me to realize there's nothing the enemy has that's greater than the God that resides inside of me. Fear begins to dissipate. Anxiety begins to go. And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit that saved me begins to be able to operate and begins to be able to move because now I've expanded the tent, the tabernacle that he resides in. Don't you love it when people say, I've asked Jesus into my heart. Well, let's give him the rest of us. Let's don't lock him in a room. Let's give him some fingers and some toes and some minds to run around in. Let's stretch this old thing so he can move around. I got to go. I could literally preach here all day long. So let me start to close with this. How about that? Let me start to close with this. I got eight minutes. God told Abram, go outside and count the stars. I want you to go beyond your limits. I don't want you to be inside a ceiling. I don't want you to be inside a limit. Miss Kathy sung another song about what you have in your hands. God told Moses to take what he had in his hand and throw it down. As long as you're holding it, I can't do anything with it. As long as you're holding it, I can't do anything with it. Watch what I can do when you let it go. Sing a new song. 1870 in Westfield College in Illinois at the annual church conference in 1870 a prophecy was given that people would soon fly like birds. Bishop Wright stood up and rebuked the evangelist for heresy. A few years later his sons Orville and Wilbur in Kitty Hawk, North Carolina Recorded the first flight ever. The bishop that rebuked the prophecy. Because he put a ceiling on what God could do. And now probably everybody in this room has been on a plane at one point or another. When we get older we know better. That's the sad part. He said be like children. The Holy Spirit wants us to be like children. All right. Here we go. I am closing now. I'm just an old country preacher. I literally, I have very little knowledge and wisdom. I I don't know scripture the way most people do. But I hear the voice of God. And I hear him speak to me. I'm just crazy enough to listen. And most of the time follow. (laughs) Unless I'm fighting him, right? So I have a challenge for you this morning. I got a challenge. And if the challenge doesn't work for you, if you pick up the challenge and it doesn't work, then it's a volunteer organization. You don't have to take up any challenge I ever offer again. I have a challenge for you this morning. 
Stand with me, if you will. The challenge isn't just for this morning, by the way. Tomorrow's February 1st. February's got, what, 28 days, shortest month, right? 29 days, leap year? 28 days, yeah. I looked at the calendar, 28 days. I think I looked at it right. It could have been in last year, who knows? So here's what I'd like to challenge you to do. I'd like to challenge you to pick a mountain, starting today. Pick a mountain in your life. Pick a mountain in your life. Pick a mountain. Not a monster, a mohill. A mohill. Pick a mountain. And I'd like to ask you to do this for the next 28 days, 29 counting today. I'd like to ask you to step outside, be it on your porch, your patio, whatever, every day for the next 28 days. And I'd like to ask you, because that's something different, outside the limits of. And I'd like to ask you to pray loudly, out loud, because faith cometh by hearing. And if you're going to trust any voice today, it's going to be CNN or Fox News. I mean, no, I'm, uh, it's going to be your voice. Because if you can't trust yourself, who can you trust, right? If you're lying to yourself, you're never going to get it right. Step outside. Speak to your problem loudly. Old Testament says, speak to the wind. Speak to the bones. New Testament, speak to the issue. Change your posture. Lift your hands differently. Put on a new worship song. Do something differently. Kneel down, even if it's this. Whatever it is. For the next 28 days, change the way you pray about this one mountain. And I am believing my God that he spoke to me for you to do this. And he'll do one of two things for you. He'll move the mountain or the mohill or he'll move your attitude towards it. Something will change. There'll either be a shift in you or a shift in the mountain. And if not, then don't take another challenge I offer you ever again. But that's how strong I believe God wants to grow us. That's how strong I believe God wants to stretch us. Not to hurt us, but to strengthen us for an outpouring that he wants to put on us to be a light to a world around us. To reach a lost and dying world for Christ in these days that are so hard to live in right now. And I'm not asking you to do something ridiculous and ask him to give you a mansion. Something within the realm of his possibilities. What is his possibilities? In the realm of what he's willing to do. He's not going to break his own law for you. I got more, but I'm done. My challenge to you is for the next month, step outside, pray differently, pray out loud, Pray for that child. Pray for whatever it is. If they're not saved by the end of the month, God will give you peace that they will be. I don't know. But he will make a difference in it. And I believe that with everything in me. And I welcome to meet with you if it doesn't change. I welcome to meet with you if it does. Because I believe he told me to challenge our church. Because he wants to pour out his spirit. And that's not in craziness, but that's in the power of his might. If you have a prayer language, pray in it because that's his perfect will. If that's you this morning, if if you've got something you want God to do, then I would ask you 
to lift your hand right now and let's pray together. Father, we come together right now in the name of Jesus. God, I don't know any mountain or mohill for anyone. But God, I'm believing you this morning. And I'm nervous. But I'm asking your people to stretch their faith and trust you. And I'm asking you to minister to them during this time and either move the mountain or minister to them till they know you have it in control. Let it be so evident that there is no doubt. I want to thank you for your word, every part. I want to thank you today that you are a God without limits. And I want to thank you for stretching me, even though it feels like sometimes that it's beyond what I can handle. We love you today and we praise you. In your most precious and holy name, minister to your people. Meet their needs. Amen and amen. Thank you for coming and being with us. We love you. Uh, I pray you never think that I'm roughing you up. I'm not. Uh, I hope it never sounds that way. God bless you. Have a great day.